be here, but Jerry's had his family just started this year. His son Parker was born uh, last year, about a year ago today. So if I could do something real quick, I would like to take a video real quick of everybody wishing Parker a happy birthday if we could real quick. So uh, let me flip this around just real quick. All right. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Parker. All right. We'll do one more. I told you I'd be something, Mom. All right, there we go. All right, so, all right, how we do games at Multimorphic? Um, <clears throat> this is a picture we took recently at the factory, and I love it. These are three. Uh, get the games, three of the same game, going to different customers with different default play fields. It shows the promise of the platform, where <clears throat> each person has picked a different game to go out. There's a Final Resistance, a Weird Al, LE, and a Heist all going out, and uh, I love this picture so much. Um, this is the pricing. It, it's just the basic business uh, base of it. You get the base machine is 8,300, and then you pick your module that goes with it. And then we sell full add-on games for $500, but many games are anywhere from zero to $200. Okay, uh, you know the, the basic argument for the system is you fill your house full of games, and you run out of space. You buy a P3, and you can uh, have up. I think my, the P3 right now has up to 17 games, and then people say, well, I like a lot of games. Well, guess what? If you want to, you can buy another base 3P system, and you can have multiple games in there, and Scott Denise just did that. He just had an extra P3 delivered to his house. So like we said earlier, we've got six modules right now, Heist, Word Owl, Cosmic Kart Racing, Kennel Lagoon, Final Resistance, Flexi Light Speed, <clears throat> and then we've got uh, five add-on games that we've got. Sorcerer's Apprentice is a full-size add-on game, and then we've got a bunch of mini games that you can buy that work on pretty much any play field. And then we've got a bunch of full feature-rich play fields that you can play. The, we've got Lexi Lightspeed that has like an eight ball, multiple, uh, eight ball physical lock. Uh, we've got the, the magnetic locks in uh, Cosmic Kart Racing. <coughs> Every shot in uh, heist can be diverted, and we've got the three-axis crane and heist. We took that concept kind of to the extreme in Weird Al's uh, play field. I think we calculated the ball paths. There's over 100 individual ball paths in Weird Al. Once you calculate up which shot paths that that ball can go into um, with all the diverters and where you can send that ball. And then we've got Final Resistance, which has that cannon that can shoot the ball at the player, we can shoot three balls at the player in, in less than half a second. <clears throat> and then we have, uh, this is something that I wanted to highlight specifically in my talk, which is about the third party development. We, we specifically enable third parties to come out and uh, develop games. So I wanted to spend a minute in my talk to talk about the third party games that we have on the platform. Grand Slam Rally was the first one that, that came, so if you have a uh, Cannon Lagoon Playfield, you've got a pitch and back game that you can buy on there called Grand Slam Rally. Uh, Hooping It Up was done by Greg Goldie. Uh, he took the uh, Lexi Lightspeed Playfield and made a basketball game for it, and then he gave it away for free to anybody who bought uh, the Lexi Lightspeed Playfield. You get a basketball game that uh, is a pretty interesting gameplay dynamic that you can you get an entirely new gameplay system with uh, Lexi for free. <coughs> Ranger in the Ruins was Nick Baldridge's first third-party game that he did. It's a roguelike game, a one-ball game that you go through and you play. You go and you discover uh, the corpses of players who have played before in the game. It's uploaded to an online server, and the games are all connected. And so you find the items that they picked up along the way. And you don't know what those items do. You have to discover what they do as you play, and you have to figure out what they do as you go along. And I've seen people who have bought the system. They've they were sold on everything, but then they played Ranger in the Ruins. They're like, okay, this is it. I love this, everything about it. And they, they bought the system because of this game, right? These are the kind of, these, these little things that are, I love about the system because they, these kind of ideas, you couldn't make, you can go to another manufacturer and it's like, hey, can we make 50 of these or can we make this? This was what the platform enables. Nick then went on with his 10-year-old daughter and they, she wanted to make a game, so he made a game with her called Sober Falls on the Heist Playfield, where they came together and they made her idea that she wanted to do. She wanted to create this world where her characters is kind of like a Sims kind of world where you're building a house, you're building this world for the characters as you're playing through the, and getting the job and going through and doing this stuff. And 
it's, it's a very interesting new gameplay concept on the heist play field. And because of that, Nick's 10-year-old daughter was the runner-up for Rookie of the Year in, in the Twippies. And she got major call-out from Jack Danger when he won that award, right? And so that's something that's really awesome, I think. That's something that the platform enabled. And I really love that that happened. <coughs> Nick's next game was Flipper Foxtrot Rhythm Explosion. This is a rhythm game that exists on the Cannon Lagoon play field. So you get to play a rhythm game on a pinball platform where it kicks out a ball whenever you, you mess up. You play pinball and you keep, get it back in there and you play a rhythm game again. So, And then the latest one is Michael Ocean, who was the software guy on, <coughs> excuse me, on Heist and on Weird Al. He's had this idea in his head for a long time. He had Dungeon Door Defender, which is a tower defense game that came out uh, recently, and this is an awesome game. I've, I've, I've been messing around with it since the beta days, and it's, it's basically you're going through waves of attackers to the door and heist. That becomes a dungeon door to this game, and the, the context completely changes, but you, then you, you survive that, and you, you take your gold and everything that you've done and, and build up um, additional uh, resources to survive future waves and things like that. <coughs> and now, Nick came and created his own company. He's now the world's smallest pinball manufacturer. He, he's building playfield modules, physical playfield modules, and selling them to our customers with Drained, which is a pinball machine that has a gobble hole and a bell in 2023. It's an EM-style game. That's where you're attacking vampires. He's got a, this awesome Ed Gorgori uh, art style to it, and it's, it's doing really well, and he's building all these out of Richmond, Virginia. And of course, he's Nick, he doesn't sleep, so he's already created a mini game for it as well called Drain Bite Size. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about our third party development. It's awesome, anybody who wants to do it, we've got a dev kit on our website, uh, multimorphic.com. There's a whole community of people in our, dev, uh, in our Discord where they're all talking to each other, they're all, everybody's excited and helping each other, bringing these things to life, bringing these things to market. Get it, making things come to life, these unique ideas that wouldn't exist otherwise. All right, so let's talk about how we design games behind the scenes. So the first thing we do is we have concept meetings. Anytime we get an idea of a game, we go through concept meetings and we talk about how, like, how are we going to handle this? What kind of game are we going to make? You know, is it going to be, <coughs> are we going to do a static play field with, with inserts on the play field? Are we going to uh, do video windows that pop up? Are we going to tell a story that way? Or are we going to do a modal game where everything, the whole scene changes? Or how are we going to tell this story and break it down? Um, and once we've kind of got the concept down, we, we've kind of got the, the, the vague notion that it's usually a lot of meetings getting through that point. <coughs> we'll go to something like this, which is the, basically everybody in the team breaks up and we all go and, and we've got these blank sheets where we'll go through and we'll do sketches ideas of the layout, the basic layout of how we think these, we come up with play failed ideas. Everybody's got these ideas of different flowy ideas of how we think this, this, these ideas will work with this theme or this idea that we've got, right? So I'm, I'm taking us through a process of how we started with Weird Al. And one thing we had an idea of Weird Al is like, hey, let's go back and forth. We got this accordion idea of going back and forth. So from these upper flippers, we wanted to add a second upper flipper, and we wanted to have this back and forth with the upper flippers. And the, I, I, in the early days, I thought of the squeeze box combo being this, this combo that we can go back and forth on. And then we've got these blanks that we start off with. These are our blank uh, that it shows us all of our possible up kicker holes that we've got. Every designer has these that we, we can choose from. You can decide which holes you want to kick up from the launch balls from. And then you can draw on top of those. And, you know, some people have better tools than others. I use the tools that I know, and I'm a design guy. I'm the, I like to use the title of the dumbest guy in the company, so I use Photoshop. So I go through here, and I go, th and I start drawing on top of these with uh, Photoshop, and I start laying out ideas. And this is where we kind of start off with and doing stuff. You can see some early ideas of, like, hey, maybe we can feed the hamster wheel on top in the middle of the spiral ramp you know, from the mezzanine up there. We, maybe we kick it in from behind the wall and kick it around there. And maybe we have an accordion that you hit, you smash up, up here in the middle part in the back. 
you know, some early ideas. And so we, we sketch around, we throw around ideas, and we, we, and I always say you start with the bad ideas and we work our way to the good ideas, right? I mean, you can't start, like they were talking in the last seminar, you know, you, the perfection is the enemy of getting stuff done. So you, you have to start with the bad ideas. You have to, like, put them down on paper and then everybody can identify what's bad. But then there's a nugget of something, a good idea in there, and you start working towards something that's better, right? So then we hand it over to TJ, who is not one of the dumb people in the company. He starts putting this in the CAD, and he starts drawing this up, and we start seeing how this stuff actually looks in physical form, and we start laying out some real concepts. So this is, again, the, the lower playful area, and we've got some, what's some, something that starts looking like Weird Al. And you can see some early concept ideas. We've got some forks on the left-hand side that lift, raise up instead of our lift ramp uh, that changed. And then you can see that the ticket counter on the left-hand side curves around instead of going straight like we had before. But the main concept is there. We've got the ticket counter in the back, and we've got um, the lift ramp on the right-hand side and things like that. And then it iterates from there. We've, we had, we had um, a magnetic assist on the spiral originally, and then whenever we started testing it, place testing it, we saw that, yeah, we were, getting, we were nailing those spiral hits right off the bat. And so we, we took the spiral, we took the magnetic assist off the spiral early on. Also, the camera lock on the right-hand side started off as a Twinkie Wiener sandwich that we were going to, uh, we were going to load up originally. And then we changed that to the UHF camera. And then originally we had an extra shot on that left-hand side that went to a, an elevator in the back that went up to the mezzanine. But then we realized we had a whole lot of ways to get up to the mezzanine level with, um, you know, the right ramp and the, the the, there were several ways to get up there to the right ramp, so we, we split that out to widen those shots on the left-hand side. But you can see also we had a wire form there. We hadn't unified that entire mezzanine into one big plastic form yet. And, it's, and it iterates some more. You know, we, we, got rid of the, we got rid of that elevator shot on the left-hand side to, to widen out the shots a little bit more. We put the camera over there. We still had the magnetic assist at this point, but we're iterating, and that's what it is. It's iterating, iterating, iterating to try to get to, to the better ideas, to try to see what happens. And eventually, you get to something like this, you know, which is, uh, if you see how batshit crazy this thing gets at the end of the day, right? Like how nuts this play field is at the end of the day. It's a completely packed play field, and you see why people, like, struggle to pull this thing out. It's heavy. Then we have to design the interface, everything down. This is where I come in. This is as a creative director. It's like we got to, what are people seeing? How are they experiencing the game as they come through? So again, we start off with bad ideas. I start throwing stuff together. I start piecing stuff together. It's like, okay, this is a museum. We're, we're, we've, concept, we've got the concept of museum. Like maybe we have, to, we have to tell people how to follow in the game. So maybe there's this, this owl pad down here at the bottom. So I throw together a crappy version of it to visualize it first. So you've got my, my really chintzy version at the, on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side is a more finished version where we've got all the actual artist art from the artist all put together and the actual pop-ups and stuff built in, spaced out, and actually put in the Unity as we, we put it out there. And then we get to the part where we're actually building it all in Unity and we can, we can simulate it. We can actually get really far in simulating the game in Unity to the point where we can, we've got people working on our games all over the, the country. And uh, a lot of times we will get pretty far down the process before we get to the Whitewood stage where we can simulate the full game. The full game will be developed before we can, we can make it a long way down the path with developing the game before the Whitewood is, is, is developed. And then we can start testing it on the Whitewood in Austin and get videos of that and then make changes and iterate uh, as we go along, right? So. So, I, and then after that, we'll, we, we might have some, we have to, on our story-based games, we have to come up with the actual story for them. So there's, a, this is more like the filmmaking process where we have to storyboard. So we'll storyboard some stuff. Then I'll make an animatic of it where I'll break up the pieces and kind of do a rough animatic of what that scene looks like. And then we'll put together the finished animations of the scene where the scene will have the, we'll usually have an intro video to the scene and then we'll have the loop 
running of the scene, and then you'll have to have animations running whenever they make the shots, and you come back to the loop. You'll have another scene when they make a shot, so this is the right turn of, of Wheelman when he makes a shot. And then you'll have the victory video whenever they beat the, vi the mode, right? The, the, the fast person passes and Wheelman escapes. Okay. And then here's just some behind the scenes stuff with Heist. We've got like, we had to start off, we had to find out Heist we were building from scratch. We were basically coming down to we had to find out who these characters were and identify them. We start off with uh, seven characters in the beginning, and we combined a couple of them to to make somebody. So we, we had to design these characters, so we would do these character turns at the beginning. Um, worked with a really talented artist in Houston that came up with these characters. Well, you, you, you have these character design process in the beginning. And Tice was my first game, so this is my even crappier sketches of the heist play field in the beginning, but you can see some some uh, really dumb sketches of this stuff, and then I hand it to TJ, and I'm like, and uh, you can see me laying out some buildings too, because I'm like, I want these to go through here, and this is where the buildings are gonna go, because the whole idea was we were building this world under glass, and I was like, we're gonna tell a story with the wizard mode where the big building is uh, the, the main building is going to be over here. The casino is going to be over here, and and things are going to happen with the lighting of these these buildings whenever the 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 big heist is happening. It when we're telling this final story at the end, and so laying out these these building numbers was important. And you get to see some early CAD designs of the layout where we we originally had like a plastic ramp on the left and a, a different kind of layout, we were, we were trying to figure out how to happen. The, the big challenge with Heist is that we wanted every shot to be divertible. We wanted it, every shot to be able to pull the ball off the, off the play field because I wanted to be able to do this jailbreak multi-ball where you could do a subtractive multi-ball where you could kick out, if you had three people in jail, you'd kick out four balls and you, you had to hit three shots and we would steal the ball off the table with those three shots to where those three people would escape and you'd have one ball left and you, you successfully broke everybody out of jail. And so in order to do that, you had to be able to have every shot divertible off the table. And so um, that was a challenge to get to make that work and so we, we had to figure out how to utilize all of our vertical up kicker holes and, and uh, pull those off the table and, and utilize the space to do that and fit that crane in there too as well. So and figure out how to feed that crane and load it up. And this is a later iteration of it. This is a little bit more uh, close to being finished, but um, the, the pop bumper is more like a pinball magic style where we were basically, what we ended up with was more like a there's no place like home arrangement where the pop bumper is banging into some targets instead of this one was, was banging into the uh, rubbers all around it. We found we got more action the other way. So we kind of iterated around that. This is an early, this is our Whitewood for Heist where we 3D printed up all the buildings, and then TJ went and hand painted them all, kind of see what it would look like in there to try to see what would happen. We the the first version of that crane had a screw uh, based extension on it. It was really slow, and we were like, "Oh, that's not going to work. Like we can't wait on that." And then TJ replaced it with the belt driven thing, and it got really fast extending out there. And that's like, "Oh, that's incredible! That thing flies out there." So we were real happy with that. Uh, my again, my first idea for that was to do a like a 3D printer gantry thing. Again, dumbest guy in the company. I was like, hey, come up with a better idea for how we can extend the ball out over the table and dangle it in front of the over the table so we can knock it off and then you know be able to uh, have something out there for the person to knock it off the, and start a two ball multi ball that way. So. And they even gave me, with that, they gave me a bashable target, too. So that was awesome. Here's some early uh, backlash design stuff. Again, we'll go through a lot, a lot of times a whole bunch of different poses and trying to find the right poses. Uh, we'll, we'll iterate on stuff to go through and find some, find some things. Here's some early attempts to try to figure out how to 
lay out the side art. A lot of times you've got to figure out how to optimize your art so it can be printed both ways on, on both sides of the cabinet. And uh, this is where we landed with the high start, and I thought it came out pretty good. And showing off all the characters. All right, with Weird Al, we, we decided on, Weird Al was a interesting theme because you have, with most bands, you've got one genre of music and everything. You got one genre of music and usually one aesthetic, right? This band looks this way and they've got this vibe to them, right? And Weird Al covers every genre, every era, everything like we've got hip-hop next to we've got a Crosby Stills and Nash song in pinball and people like playing that song like they pick that song over and over and over again in pinball put that on my tombstone um, so like we had to find a way to put that in a game and make it all cohesive and so we we talked about a whole lot of different options like what's our container what's what's the way we do that and so tossed around a bunch of ideas and we landed on this idea of this museum of, of we, we came up with a lot of different names with this this museum of natural hilarity that we came up with and so we I thought about this great hall using the the dinosaur from uh, from his album that he had and so we were gonna make this dinosaur that danced in the middle of the uh, thing and so we were these are some of the concepts for how we would uh, um, do the the floor and we, we laid out a bunch of different options with my artist Matt and that one up in the top right it was like I like I like what we're doing there but I saw once I saw the grid on the floor I was like you know what we could do we could do those those lit tiles like Michael Jackson did in, in his video and like we can have the ball tracking light the tiles up as the ball rolls around on it and it's been it's every, every single time we're able to do something new with the ball tracking in the great game I really appreciate that so that turned out to be one of those good effects and this is the uh, the final floor grid that we ended up with. So it worked out pretty well. And we were able to hide all the little details, like hide all the little little items and jokes all around the hall in there. And again, here's the early concept um, that we had with it, one of the early concepts that we had. Again, fit around the back wall, feed it into the hamster loop um, directly from the mezzanine there. We, and we had the, the straight shot to the elevator um, to the right side and then there was another one where we had a loop that then diverted around the back wall to the hamster wheel um, playing around with different concepts <clears throat> but uh, Scott Denisi actually is the one that that suggested doing the crossing wire form across there something that we could we could remove and pull out with the game and um, yeah that was a, a really good idea we I'm really glad we put that in there and I like putting this in here because sometimes people don't see like how brilliant TJ is, but this is the the light boxes we have inside the uh, accordion uh, bridge that we've got. Um, that's the plastic inside that's that's blocking in the light that that matches the art that TJ made. Um, so it just matches the lines of of the art that Matt drew up perfectly. So I like showing that off. And then when we come to designing these modes, um, you know, this is the kind of the iteration process we've got. This was for I'll sue you, I'll sue you. Um, so I'm basically like, okay, I'll go and grab a art that I find somewhere, and I'm like, okay, we'll do the courtroom in the back. We'll have Al in a, in a judge's outfit slide in in the chair, and then we'll have a legal pad where we'll be counting up the charges on a legal pad, and we'll have a calculator that'll fly in. And I'll give all this stuff to Matt as reference, and then Matt draws it up, and this is what he comes up with. And he's got little details in there, like the offices, the law offices of Yankovic and Yankovic up there, and then he's got the seal of justice up there. It's got a seal on it, uh, like all these little nice touches on there. So, and then we had to make all these Weird Al characters, right? And he created, he basically made this puppet, and he created costumes for every single different song that we had so for us to animate with and uh, these different outfits for all of them and so I had a plan for animate these Adobe has this character animator thing and originally like they could you could 
they had just released this thing where they could do a body tracker, where you could get up there and try to body track it, and I was planning on going and trying it out, but it was real janky and it wasn't working. So um, I did it where I, I got Al in the audio recording booth for three hours, and Al is everything you've ever heard about him. He's the nicest person you've ever met, and he's he it, it, he was absolute stud in that uh, recording studio, and and he he. I, I just completely destroyed his voice for three hours. He brings 100% energy from the first second to the last second. He was like, yeah, I'm here for as long as you need me. My voice is going to hurt, be destroyed tomorrow, but I'm totally here for it. And so he would come through, and he did all the voices. And then what I did was I get into Adobe Animator, and I would act out, like, the face and the eyebrows and the moving around. And so um, I would go through and... Do the acting the out. Paradise, heathen, we've handcrafted a replica of your immoral flipper machine, only less electro and more mechanical. The goal is scoring points for the afterlife with hard work and choring, fool. So that's like my eyebrows and my head movements and stuff in there. That is tracking to, to do that um, on a green screen that I did because I, I could get it doing that and tracking that. And then I would tie it in and, and bring it in and animate each thing. Welcome to head. Paradise, heathen. We've handcrafted a replica of your immoral flipper machine, only less electro and more mechanical. The goal is scoring points for the afterlife with hard work and choring, fool. And so we'd bring it in and do that. And this is a little tidbit. The very first, if any of y'all were around when the P3 was first being shown around at shows, the very first, one of the very first P3 prototypes looked exactly like that. this Amish pinball machine that we had it was a wooden pinball machine with no head and it looked like a piece of furniture like that so this is my throwback my homage my homage to that first p3 that we had yeah huh the legs are different no i, I made it a little more ornate for the for this one because it's amish furniture you know you got to go all out for amish furniture so um we uh was that wrap up okay yeah so uh we um uh it's about out of time completely Couple minutes. Okay. So, anyways, it, just to bind is that we we would make scenes like we made the the, the chore board and everything like that. Uh, this was for we we made the Belvedere for his car. This is his actual car, right? That that he sang for his first song, which was uh, Belvedere Cruising. This is the the this is the actual. This is my bad drawing again for the topper that became the. This is uh, the actual topper that we had. I was like, what? Make the head go back and forth, and then TJ made it made it good. And then, oh, the last thing, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll show a couple scenes of uh, Final Resistance here. Scott couldn't be here. He, he did the Pinball Olympics, so his voice is shot. So he, he apologizes for not being here. But um, the, uh, so Al, at the end of the day, he just destroyed his voice and did everything else. And I, at, we were finished with it. And then I said, I got one more thing to ask you. And you can say no if you want. But my developer, uh, Michael, his son is a huge fan. If you could just say just something real quick. To his son, and uh, and uh, real quick and high, and he's like, ah, absolutely no problem. Like anybody else would be like, nah, I want to go home and everything. So he did this, and we made this for Michael's son. Hey, Sammy, it's uh, your close personal friend Weird Al Yankovic, and I just want to say hi. Uh, you know, you never call, you never write. Uh, I, I miss you terribly. I'm worried sick about you. I hope you're eating your broccoli, and uh, I hope we get to hang out again like we did back in the old days. Remember? Oh, I, such great memories. Anyway, Sammy, keep in touch. Don't be a stranger, and don't forget about lunch on Thursday. Okay, bye. Anyways, the hope is to put that in with the flipper code in Weird Al. So if your name is Sammy, you might get that in the game. So. Anyways, uh, Final Resistance, here's some uh, stuff with Final Resistance. Scott, Al knows, uh, Scott knows more about it, but in that inner loop, there's actually ramps in the back, so the inner loop will never actually inner loop. They'll always jump over the wall to go left and right in there. So this was his original drawing in the beginning, and he had to ship, but he, he just wanted, he designed this, this vertical rock, this vertical ship, this rocket, to like fire him at the ball as quickly as possible. He wanted to fire it at the flippers as quickly as possible. And this was his original CAD drawings. Scott draws in CAD because he's smarter than me. So he, he came in and, and with these drawings, and then TJ cleaned them all up and made them manufacturable. So these are his original drawings for Final Resistance. And then this is kind of the original, the, the early... Uh, CAD stuff, the original concept design for the, the the stuff, and then that's the how the artwork turned out. And and Jonathan Bertrand did an excellent job on the art. Anyways, um, new P3, you ordered today. It's, you can get it in about two or three months. 
and uh, everything's uh, going along swimmingly. So, all right, I know I'm out of time, so I appreciate you guys coming to my TED Talk. Thank you.